I'm Kip Morris. I was uh, uh, the head softball coach in 1981. And this summer I am scheduled to retire after 25 years at Nike. My name is John Wenzel. I was the head coach of softball from 1982 to 1988. Um, currently, I teach in the special ed program at Wellesley High School in Massachusetts. I'm Barry Haskell. I was head softball coach from 1988 to 1994. I'm the retired superintendent of schools from Plymouth, Massachusetts. I'm Jenny Allard. I'm the current head coach of Harvard softball. Uh, I took over the program in 1994. And I'm Pat Henry. Um, served as an athletic administrator um, uh, from 1980 through uh, 2019. Uh, I retired as a senior associate director of athletics and I'm currently retired living in Plymouth. I'm actually in my 21st year in the department. Um, and uh, I think my eighth year is program managed with, with softball. Uh, and I can say my acclimation to Harvard athletics way back in the beginning Pat, Jenny, John were all very generous with their time and helping me get up and running. And now here it is a couple of decades later. Well, it was the uh, winter of 1979, two uh, students, uh, Betty Apolito and Sheila Sparks showed up into my office at what was then 60 Boylston Street and said there was a softball club and they needed someone to coach. I was a assistant to the AD, Jack Reardon at the time and had a wide range of responsibilities, liaison with the admissions office, secretary to the uh, faculty committee on athletics. Uh, I ran uh, track meets, uh, indoor and outdoor. And uh, I, I uh, typed the invoices that paid officials. So um, they thought that, that, you know, why not uh, add softball to that as well? And we uh, spent the first two years as a, a club sport, uh, 79 and 80. Um, kid, it's hard to believe that anyone could replace you, but um, I was hired to replace you as assistant to the director, working with Jack and Pat. And they saw that I had a baseball background. I had uh, played a little and had coached, uh, assistant coach at Clark University before I went to graduate school. So when I was hired as an administrator, I think you know, Jack just threw across the table, hey, how'd you like to coach softball? And, um, again, no search committee, just look across the table. Maybe we can save some money and ask John if he wants to do it. So in lieu of being an administrator in the spring, I wore a couple hats. I came to, uh, to Harvard softball a little bit differently. I was a teacher and the head softball coach at Dartmouth High School. And I had some success there. We'd won three state championships in five years at, at uh, the high school level. And someone sent me the job posting from Harvard softball and they hand wrote on it. If you apply, you will be given careful consideration. They never signed it. And to this day, I don't know who sent it. Based on that, I sent in a, a resume and <laughs> Pat was on that committee along with two or three students and, and offered me that position. And it was the only position I, I held at Harvard. Uh, in order to do that, I left the classroom. So my wife and I talked about how we would manage that because she was also teaching computer science and coaching at Dartmouth High School. And I went into the fundraising business, which I had been doing a little bit on the side, doing product fundraising, all those shiny brochures that your kids come home with. I did that and coached softball, but I came out of a kind of a roundabout way. Barry, I'd love to see that letter. I'd love, love to look at the handwriting. Yeah, <laughs> I still have it. Believe it or not, it was written, written, handwritten in the lower right-hand corner. I had the good fortune of, of, you know, having these three great leaders pass the program forward to each other and then on to myself. And I was coaching, I, I was coaching at the University of Iowa as an assistant. And after my second year there, I was just getting a little concerned about the balance academically, athletically, and what was going on. And I noticed there was a posting and I kind of put it in the back of my head. I didn't initially apply. And I was on the NFCA's board as the assistant coach rep for our coaches association. And I went down to the championship. We had meetings. And I remember that Kathy Aronson was there and she was the head coach at Yale at the time. And she says, hey, Jenny, how, how are you doing? How's it going? I said, great. And she says, hey, do you want to be a head coach? Do you know Harvard is hiring? You should apply. And I said, I did see the posting. So I drove from Oklahoma City to Iowa 
and submitted my resume. And then I went off recruiting for the summer from Iowa. Then lo and behold, in July, Pat Henry called me and she said, so now we're onto the softball search and we'd really love to talk with you. So we set up a time to kind of do a phone interview and then I must have passed that. And then I got an on-campus interview. And once I got onto campus, Pat said, oh, John, John Wenzel, Bill Clary, these are the people that are going to be on. I said, John Wenzel, I know that name. I said, I got a recruiting letter from Harvard and it was signed by John Wenzel, I think. And so I brought that letter into my interview and it was hysterical. Well, you know, the, the process was very informal, as you can tell by uh, what um, the early coaches have talked about in terms of how they got to their positions. Um, Kit was in place when I uh, came to Harvard. In fact, Kit was in the office that eventually got assigned to me. So Kit had to move so Pat could move in. It was, it was uh, musical, musical chairs and offices at the time. And then after one year and, and really sort of getting us started, Kit went off to Yale um, to bigger and better things. And, and who's going to do all the things that Kit was doing? And so I turned around and marched back into Jack's office and very naively said, Jack, and if you think that I'm going to be the next softball coach at Harvard, you have another thing coming because that would not be a good idea. And I think it really struck a chord with Jack because I finally talked him into at least considering um, replacing that position and trying to see whether or not... Um, uh, there'd be a coaching match as well. And in the end, um, it was. And I had met John uh, through some common Olympic Committee work and USA basketball work, um, and it all clicked and it was, it was wonderful. You know, Betty Apolito was the captain of the program uh, uh, through both years as a club team and her uh, senior year as well. In her senior year, in a leadership role, uh, she was joined by our uh, left handed shortstop, Lisa Bernstein and uh, Karen Pelletier. Uh, probably the best athlete we had on the team at the time was Elaine Holpuck, who played uh, uh, basketball and uh, was a catcher on the softball team. Uh, you know, I still remember a, a home run that she hit against Yale and New Haven that's probably still rolling. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, another uh, really uh, good athlete who was a junior, and I was there, Ellen Jakovic, uh, an outfielder who also played soccer. There was this uh, esprit de corps, uh, spirit of camaraderie, and there were opportunities for leadership coming from every corner and every level. Obviously, you can think of a lot of kids. I think of my first two captains, Diane Boatler and Marlene Schufs, and Kit will know both of them. Um, tremendous kids, mature, responsible, and these kids were so appreciative to have the title varsity and to have uniforms and to be able to pack themselves into a van um, that they were on top of the world. The one who had the biz biggest impact in terms of athletes was Jerry Rubin. She came my second year and she was the first trained pitcher. She was the Jim Abbott. He was a pitcher. He was born without his right hand. And, you know, you never knew the difference. Well, Jerry was born without her left hand. And after 10 minutes, you never knew the difference. And she was a competitor. She was a softball playing athlete. She took winning and losing and working hard seriously. And she allowed us to compete. Um, three years later, Laura Browning came in from Oregon and she took us a level beyond that. Um, I think of those kids, my first captains, and then Jerry, and then um, Laura Rowning as foundational players. That's exactly what I was thinking as you were speaking, the, the makings of a great foundation. And I remember Nancy Pryor, who was one of uh, the first captains, and very, very strong leadership qualities. And, and she and Elizabeth Crowley, who everybody called Woody, yeah. and probably <laughs> the best hitter I ever saw at any level. I agree. Uh, I yeah, agree. she was all Ivy for three years. And it, uh, in her senior year, she led the nation in uh, batting average and home runs and, and things like that. When we started to get a few players, the, the one that really made a difference for us was Julie Fromholz out of California. Uh, she was a legitimate pitcher. And then uh, we were able to recruit from Stone and Mass, which was uh, Christine Carr. And she and Nancy Sparrow, who are probably the two 
uh, most prominent high school pictures in uh, you know the early 90s. We we had them both, and that really allowed us to compete at a high level. So we weren't also the uh, the the team in between your competitive games. And then we started to get into players like Amy Reinhold, Amy Reinhardt, excuse me, who was uh, one of the, uh, the first softball player to get into the Harvard Hall of Fame. But she was a legitimate recruit coming out of Illinois. And I had a great base because I don't know that Barry knew this, but it, the freshman class that he handed off to me in my freshman year would go on as seniors to win the first Ivy League title. So in that class, we had a one-two great pitching combination um, as freshmen of Tasha Cup and Heather Brown. We also had two key captains, Jana Meter and Elizabeth Walker, who were also pitchers. And from them, the program just kind of grew with the likes of Tasha Cup senior year being Ivy Pitch of the Year in 98, us going undefeated, winning the first Ivy title with Chelsea Toke as a freshman, who's also Hall of Famer with Tasha Cup. We had Deborah Abels. We had Tiffany Witten, a Hall of Famer in 2003. We had Kara Broatmarkle in 2004, who to date has thrown the longest game for Harvard in the Ivy League, 19 innings. 283 pitches or something, you know, zero, zero for 18 innings, top of the 19th, Princeton scores one bottom of the 19th. We score two win it two, one and a walk off. And she says, if I would have known that I would have given up a run earlier and gotten done get this game finished earlier. And we had Shelly Maddock on the mound for us who graduated in 2008 was Ivy pitcher of the year. Um, but that 2007 class, you know, Julia Kidder is captain. Um, Sarah Shaughnessy, Lauren Brown, um, and Susie Winkler. That was a strong senior class that really propelled the team in terms of culture and the way we were going to do things moving forward. I think they were really, really pivotal. Another great class was the 2010 class with Margot Black, Stephanie Kreisick, Melissa Shelber, great leaders, Jessica Pledger, Jennifer Franzese. Under that weekend was a was a year we had Rachel Brown come in. She came in in 2009, arguably, statistically, the best pitcher and one of the best pitchers in the history of the Ivy League. Definitely statistically, one of these best pitchers in, in the history of Harvard softball with her strikeout records and her ability just to command other teams. Also had, you know, Casey Lang, freshman of the year, hitting home runs. Had Jane Alexander, player of the year at shortstop. Just brought in so much great talent when they saw that Harvard softball could compete at a high level, not just within the league, but outside of the league as well. And I think what really propelled us is going out of region. As you can tell from the, from the early years, we had a lot of student athletes who were playing more than one sport, often two sports. Some of these kids were even playing three sports. So for the growth of women's athletics at Harvard and in particular, you know, sort of uh, spotlighting what happened here in softball, you could kind of see it across our own Harvard programs, but you could also see it across the Ivy League. There was only one other um, um, school in the league that was offering such, I believe Jenny, I'm correct, and that may have been Princeton. Mm -hmm. And so it took us years. We were chasing Princeton over the years. Um, and at, at, at whatever inflection point uh, we prevailed, um, simply because uh, we were doing the things that we needed to do to, to support the, the students uh, in all ways to be able to play their sport at a higher level. So as you all know well, recruiting and developing talent is the key part of the job. How did you recruit during your tenure and how did you see recruiting grow over time? But when I first came to Harvard, coaches were not out on the road recruiting. Um, I believe the only coach coaches on the road at the time were football and maybe some men's ice hockey, but the rest of the coaches were at home on the phones and writing handwritten letters. The NCA rules at the time allowed alumni to be recruiters. Harvard and the whole Ivy League was very heavily dependent on this alumni recruiting network. I would say this, that once uh, we were able to bring in full-time coaches for any of our sports, uh, including softball recruiting, that, that was an inflection point from a recruiting standpoint, because now the coaches had the ability um, and somewhat of a financial base to um, reach out and do some travel. 
John talked about earlier uh, in the fact that until Barry took over, we really didn't have a, a great pitcher. Most of our recruiting was internal. Uh, uh, try to find someone who would be willing to uh, go out there and, and uh, uh, stand on the mound and deliver the ball to the competition and then play hard defense. We pretty much took what we had. Uh, you know, I can remember being aware of Jerry Rubin uh, a little bit at the end of uh, my time at, at, at Harvard, but uh, everything was internal for us. When I took over for John, uh, the university decided that it was going to uh, spend a little bit more on some of the efforts. And I got one recruiting trip a year that I could go to. And it's interesting is we would plan that around a national tournament or two, depending on where they were. I was also coaching 18 and under softball. So I had a team that had won three or four New England championships and we would travel to tournaments. So while I'm doing double duty, both as a coach, you're working and having the kind of contact that John talked about, people who showed an interest that were going to be at national tournaments, uh, and then we would go watch them. We relied on videotape uh, at the time of sending out and providing guidelines so that we could assess talent from a distance because we were limited as to who we could bring. And like uh, both John and Kit, we relied on the second sports. So, you know, you kind of do the things you need to do in order to kind of move the program forward a little bit. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, being full-time, you now could travel. And instead of being allowed as Barry was one trip, we had a small recruiting budget that just developed over time. And I targeted the high play areas, the areas where students were playing year round, the warmer climates. Tons of correspondence, as John did, taking families around, taking student athletes around, you know, supporting applicants with admissions and writing letters of recommendation. But now recruiting, um, recruiting blew up when email became very, very popular. And then it's taken an even better turn with social media. And now people recruit via Twitter because kids are, instead of sending you the old VHS cartridge you would watch, then that went to a, a DVD disc. Then it went to a YouTube link and now it's clips on Twitter. Now we have access to everything and recruiting is literally 24 seven. You know, you could just spend a lot of time and we do spend a ton of time recruiting, evaluating talent. What I did was probably 2% of what Jenny does. Um, I never traveled. I would answer correspondence. I would take families around when they came and you know, try to encourage uh, them wherever we could. But I'm not sure that I ever made a difference on anyone up at Byerly Hall uh, getting in. I think I could strengthen cases if they were looking to admit someone and you know, I rated them one at softball. I think that would, uh, might help tip the scale. But recruiting was, like Kit said, internal. We got interest cards that freshmen all fill out. And if they had the word softball on there, I made sure that I contacted them in September and October. Although I did write that one letter to Jenny, that one handwritten letter. That's why I want to see Barry's letter. I remember when Jenny came to her interview, she had that handwritten letter. Little did I know that you'd bring that to my office a few years later. So, so now we will move over to preseason travel. Back in the Jurassic era, <laughs> preseason pre travel involved uh, going from the yard or the houses over to Soldier's Field. Uh, and, and that was uh, uh, pretty much the extent of it. Uh, in 1981, that actually worked out pretty well because the, uh, the last day of spring break uh, happened to be the day our oldest child uh, was born. My wife and I were living in a freshman dorm, Hurlbut, and Matthew was born at 6.40, and we were all back in the dormitory by midnight. <laughs> My first three years, spring break um, entailed Hemingway Gymnasium, the IAB, and Briggs. And one of those years, it snowed, and we're looking out the window at snow coming down and thinking of all the other teams and all the other college kids in America uh, down in Florida, and we're in the IAB throwing balls around. So um, there was no spring trip until my third or fourth year, I think it was 85 or 86, where we piled into two vans and drove to North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. 
one of the worst things I've ever done. Uh, <laughs> 18 hours in a van. Um, we were all excited and gung ho. You know, the vans were rock and rolling out of Cambridge. But, you know, by hour, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, it was quiet. That broke the ice. And for the next year, we took, we flew. I mean, everyone had to buy their own ticket, but we flew. And I think we flew my last year too. Well, the first year I had followed John's lead because he had set them up for the following year and we went to Myrtle Beach as well. Uh, but the last year that I was there, uh, we went to Hawaii to play for spring break. That's the one at least the athletes who were with me, they talk about all the time. <laughs> they don't remember any softball, but they do remember how wonderful it was uh, to, to go to spring break to Hawaii. One of my fondest memories is one of the first games we played with the University of Hawaii at Hilo. The coach came over to me and he said, what's your record? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, we're 16 and three. And I said, 16 and three. And I said, that's great. This is our second day outside. <laughs> and taking over from Barry with the, the, having this spring break week, we had that in play, um, you know, as part of preseason that we would train, you know, indoors in the facilities we could get. And, you know, as I was hired, the discussion about, you know, the friends of Harvard softball. And I remember John Wenzel as an administrator when I was on first, you know, early days of, of my coaching years at Harvard, talking to me about some of the pioneers of the sport and reaching out to them to develop a friends group and things like that. That afforded us to have a spring break trip where we're fundraising for this, along with getting department help to make sure we could be competitive in conference because your whole preseason is about being ready for conference. What did that mean from a department perspective? So when um, Jenny was hired, we moved the program to a level one, varsity level one, which meant that, um, that um, they had all of the opportunities and all of the expenses that all of the other varsity programs had. We had these out of season or, or preseason trips um, where Jenny's team is now, you know, experiencing three of those. And I don't think there's any more room to do anymore given the academic calendar and the competitive calendar in the spring. As you can see over my shoulder, uh, Soldiers Field is the home of the softball facility. Uh, it is a state-of-the-art enclosed facility with permanent brick dugout, backstop netting, outfield padding, press box, sound system, bullpens, and the Kaplan family three-seat <laughs> pavilion adjacent to the field. <laughs> Just like you remember, John well, Wenzel, isn't it? <laughs> well, Kit being the great guy that he, that he is and was, left me to host the Ivy tournament my first year. And not only did we not have one field, we needed three fields. All the infields were grass and they get, you know, pretty chewed up when you run. So it's like a lot of divots. And to get a kid to keep his head down on a ground, you know, her head down on a ground ball uh, was a real challenge and took, took real bravery to play on those. You know, the kids nowadays just would not believe what we played on back then. You know, as I recall, uh, we were allowed to begin spring sports, I think on the first or second of February. Uh, and it was still cold, so we were indoors uh, in Briggs cage in the early days as a club sport. And then when Briggs was uh, being renovated for basketball, uh, we moved to Cox cage, which no longer exists. And then would move to the, you know, I think Western perimeter of soldiers field. I, I, we never saw any dirt anywhere. We had a grass field and the building and grounds crew uh, put up a wooden backstop. Young kids from Alston would come and tear down the boards every year every night. And so we would nail them back up to start practice every day. It was the, uh, the beginning, but you know, I don't know that we ever felt that we were without, we didn't know what we didn't know. And uh, it was enough. Well, I inherited that uh, JV baseball field and uh, it was very wet. So there often we'd have to chase the seagulls oh. and, and uh, other birds out of the outfield. The head of facilities, Bob Jutris, came out to watch us that fall, and he was kind of embarrassed that we were playing there. And he managed to come in there, and they put, they built the, the field uh, that preceded the one that you have now that was an enclosed field with fences and dugouts and was, uh, at the time, made to regulation. And they filled in six feet 
of fill they put in there in order to bring that up to a level of the baseball field. That's how low it had been. We actually went over and used the gym in the law school in order to practice. So we would go over up into the law school and use their squash courts for pitching practice. So Harvard is, you know, very, uh, very flexible. There are lots of facilities around. I would say the first 12 years that I was at Harvard, it was similar to Barry. The field he described is what, you know, was the home field, had been the home field of Harvard softball. We used any space we could get our hands on to train. And then in 2007, two huge things happened that I think really catapulted the program. First, we had a renovated field. And it just made a world of difference in terms of size, expanding the dugouts, bigger dugouts. We also put in netting behind home plate as opposed to chain link fence. They also got the infrastructure for the bubble for indoor training in preseason. So they asked, they took the grass out of Harvard Stadium, put the AstroTurf down, put lighting in and put the infrastructure in for the bubble also called the dome. And that goes up right after the football season. Really the icing on the top was the Kaplan family hitting facility. That was a joint venture with the friends of Harvard baseball and the friends of Harvard softball and the Kaplan family. You know, we landed with this three season hitting facility and it is just gorgeous. Over time, student and parent expectations have elevated and they continue to elevate. Um, and we by no means feel like we are the Taj Mahal of uh, college athletics, that's for sure. We build our facilities for students to participate in. We don't necessarily build them uh, for filling huge arenas uh, with, with people. And you can see that around the facilities. Uh, so I, I'd like to give each of you the opportunity to either share a favorite memory, speak to something about uh, your legacy or anything else that you wanted to share with us. My greatest memory in all of the sporting events I've seen and had a chance to experience uh, over the last half century was to be able to uh, coach the first Harvard softball team that beat Yale. Uh, that was uh, very exciting and has uh, stayed with me uh, over time. Uh, second thing is that uh, the company from uh, uh, which I'm about to retire, Nike, uh, the opportunity to work with Harvard softball and the department as a whole has been a, a labor of love. And, you know, the last thing I would say uh, in the presence of my successors, you know, I came across a, a card that I was given years ago by one of the players on the team. And it reads, why was Cinderella such a terrible softball player? And it says, no, it's not the glass cleats. And you open it up and it says, uh, because she had a pumpkin for a coach. Uh, <laughs> Well, that part got better, uh, <laughs> it's clear. And I would tell uh, all of you uh, who have been in the job since 1981, I am in awe of what each of you has accomplished. So thank you. I think it was the fourth year I was coached, mid eighties, we had gone to round robin scheduling rather than my first three years, it was an Ivy tournament. And uh, Cornell called and we, they were a club team at the time, mid eighties, um, wanted to play two games and we we're always willing to help them out. So we scheduled two games on a Saturday. They had a place to stay and everything. So Friday night, my wife and I are nine o'clock. We're probably eating haagen and getting ready to watch Dallas. And the phone rings, it's the Cornell club president. Um, coach Wenzel, uh, we're in Harvard Square. Our coach couldn't make it. We don't have a place to stay. Could we sleep in one of your gyms? Now, you know, of course, they can't sleep in one of their gym, one of our gyms. Perhaps if I went in, you know, we could have slept. They could have slept in in uh, Briggs or something. So I put them on hold, and I I told Nancy what the problem was, and I said, look, Nancy, I either have to go in and stay up all night with them at Briggs, or, you know, maybe they could come here. So Nancy said bring them here. So we had the Cornell club, nine players and three roommates who wanted to come to Boston, you know, for the weekend and a good time staying on our floor in Cambridgeport uh, so that they could play the next day. 
<laughs> Pat, I and, don't even know if you knew that. So uh, that's a new one for me. <laughs> well, that's probably good that Pat hadn't heard of it until now. So everything yeah. <laughs> mental household. <laughs> Well, I had a manager, uh, someone who wanted to come and be a manager who had no background. And uh, obviously, like all of our kids at Harvard, she had uh, lots of ability. We were traveling to the Penn Princeton weekend and we got snowed out. So we called and I talked to Pat and she said, well, you know, you're going to stay till Monday or Tuesday and play your games and come back. She says, uh, do you have money so the kids can eat and do other things? And uh, the Manager was with me and I said, do, do we have enough money to cover this? And she said, yes. She said, I have $8,000. <laughs> I said, where'd you get $8,000? She said, well, I, I went over to the Holyoke Center and I requested $8,000 and they gave me a check. And I said, what'd you do with it? She says, well, I have the money. I said, where is it? She says, it's in my room. She came in a paper bag with $8,000 in cash. And she thought as the manager that this was going to be her responsibility. And uh, we had to talk about that, but I don't know if you remember, Pat, was talking to the Holyoke Center as to why they would ever give an 18 or a 19 year old a, a check for $8,000. And she'd gone over to some bank and they cashed it for her. <laughs> yeah. Those were the days. <laughs> Those were the days. So obviously with the longest tenure, I have a ton of stories, but, but I'll keep three, three memories uh, prominent. The first is that I had the opportunity to meet Betty Ippolito. And I can remember the energy and the excitement and more so the pride that she had. And I had a memory from a wedding from my captain of the 2007 team. She was married in Boston and she invited every single teammate from the 2007 team. And to see all those young women bonding and acting like they hadn't lost a step and this is four or five years after they graduated was just astounding. But when you see that level of impact, it's not just about how we're impacting them, it's how they're impacting each other. Lastly, I would just end with, you know, we had a, we have camps on campus now, and in the winter we have a camp in the bubble. And a student asked me um, at the camp. One of the questions was, you know, wh why why have you been at Harvard so long? Like, what what what's the best part of your day? And what you know, what is it about it? And I said, my student athletes. I said that's what we wake up thinking about. And I said that's my work. My work isn't doing paperwork. My work is thinking about my student athletes and the support and the growth of the development of the entire Harvard softball community, all the students. That's so I'm, I'm most proud of that community feel that I think really has been built over time that all of you have really helped develop as well. So for that, I thank everyone. And I'm more than grateful. In the school year, 1993-94, we had five head coach openings. And Jenny was one of those. But I will tell you, you know, we made those hires throughout the year, but many of them uh, towards the spring. Today, all five of those coaches are with us still, thriving at Harvard, being incredible coaches and mentors uh, and educators for our students. And for the softball program, Jenny, you have done the most incredible job. And all four of you are part of this journey, um, laying the base so that we could be where we are today. And I'm so proud of the students that all of you have brought into the program and through the program, and now are part of the softball community as alumni. And it's just, it's absolutely terrific. We're so proud of you all. Thank you for all four of you for the work and the effort and the foresight that you had and, and um, the raking of the field and everything that you did for the program. It's absolutely fabulous. Thank you.